Hey, what's going on, party people? It's your boy BQ with the Impact Lounge YouTube channel. I thought I would go ahead and step in this week since the total nonstop Impact guys are now moving back to their old channel. I thought I'd come back and do a review here, video style, of the latest episode of Impact Wrestling. Now, if you didn't hear what I said on a previous, previous upload, I will be taking the reviews back over. The B-Side podcast is no more. The format of that show is no more. So I'll be stepping back in to do reviews. I've recruited my boy TW. Uh, he's done one episode of the Talking Bout podcast here on the channel. So he's going to uh, step in and do the reviews with me. Now, the, out of everybody I've ever podcasted with, from the bottom of my heart, I feel that TW and I have had the best chemistry. I feel like I've had the best chemistry with him out of everybody. So I hope to... Um, you know, do the channel justice again and bring back a, a good, you know, positive yet honest review uh, for you guys here at the channel. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to run down this episode of Impact that just aired. Um, I'm going to talk about the TNA episode a little bit first. Um, I'm not going to really review that one from top to bottom, but I'm really curious. I've seen a little bit on Twitter. I'm pretty, you know, I'm really curious to hear what you guys thought of the show. It seemed like, a, you know, the majority of the people that I've seen kind of found the show to be weak. But I wouldn't say, I, I, I guess I can kind of see where people come from saying that. I personally enjoyed the show. Um, but, you know, one positive I'll say about the episode of Impact from Atlanta, I felt that this was the most engaged audience they've had since Windsor. I really felt from top to bottom they did a really good job you, you could hear them now there's a clear improvement in the audio and i've said that before and then you know sometimes it goes back to how it sounds but there was a clear improvement for the tna episode i feel like the audio sounded like the way it does before you know where in the past um obviously this was mixed differently on different days because we had a different announce team but you know what I'm talking about, where the audio is very compressed with the audience and there's all this focus on the commentary. That's how I felt the episode of TNA sounded. I thought it sounded really dead in there. And then I, at the same time, it was, it's hard to, I really like seeing the TNA, you know, turnbuckle pads and everything, but it is a little hard to get into it when, you know, when we're thinking TNA, we're thinking of a larger audience, brighter lights, passionate crowd, you know what I mean? So it didn't quite feel the same, but I, I felt it was a fun episode, but for what it was, you know what I mean? I wouldn't have interest in watching it on a regular basis, but I feel like for what it was, it was good. And if you guys don't know, I am in my hotel room right now. If you haven't heard me say before, uh, I'm on military orders in Mississippi this month. So I'm in my hotel room, just kicking it. I got my LA Clippers bear back there in the background, little piece of home, you know what I mean? But uh, that's where I'm currently broadcasting from so uh with the episode though i don't feel the crowd was they, they were they looked a little tired um i'm going to assume that there was a longer taping that day you know usually i think they take two episodes worth they probably did two episodes plus the tna content so you can see the crowd was appear to be a little bit tired with this one but here is the other thing when you look at the people who were on the the card it's not to take anything away from them and their talent level, but it is difficult to get excited about guys like Kid Cash, Chase Stevens. Um, when 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 we've seen them on Impact, they're getting squashed. You know, they lo they both lost the moose in under three minutes, so it's hard to to get excited when those guys are coming out and and you know when they haven't. You, there's no build. There's no anticipation. I don't want to use that word build. We use that so much in wrestling. There's no anticipation of these guys competing in these matches because in the times we saw them before, they just, you know, got squashed. And then Chase Stevens actually did get squashed again, which makes me think, you know, he looks to be in pretty good condition. Maybe he can't go. I don't know if he still wrestles at all. Um, but, you know, he, he pretty much got squashed by Hernandez. Now we got Herman Hernandez, who they kind of treated as the, you know, the big name, the main eventer for this thing. He comes out almost almost as the baby face, you know, but he was just on Impact Television not long ago with the OGs, you know, heel faction, never beat LA LAX once, 
you know, so we never, we didn't, we haven't seen Hernandez be successful on impact in a while. So, and th- this is the guys you're building the, the show around. And then you got Johnny Swinger. Um, you, you guys know I'm not really big on the, the Swinger thing. You know, Manic and Suicide was cool. Easily the most over part of the show. They were really cool. And then, um, you know, the Rhino and uh, Madman Fulton thing was kind of whatever. I mean, how, how, how many times are we going to get old school rules on Impact Wrestling? Uh, we got it on the TNA episode and on the Impact Wrestling episode. So overall, I thought it was, you know, entertaining for what it was. I'm glad it was only an hour. I don't think it was a good build up to the No Place Like Home show. You know what I mean? I wouldn't see this and get overly excited for the other show, but it was cool for, for what it was. There were some aspects of it with the, you know, the backstage, the, the colors and the lighting and the brightness and everything. So there were some aspects of it that I'm like, man, I, I really think they could use some of this in the, in the current impact product, you know, with the presentation. I liked the music a lot better. I've gotten pretty tired of the, uh, the impact background music. I feel like they've been using it for quite some time and it's it's probably time to switch things up a little. But uh overall the show was you know, it was cool. You know, was it phenomenal? No. I think had they, you know, again had the crowd seen whether it was in person or on TV, guys like Chase Stevens could cash come out and have some kind of like actual momentum, you know, maybe it would have been cooler, but the mannequin suicide thing kind of saved the show in my opinion. Um but let's get let's get to impact here. Uh, I'm going to start with the main event. The main event to me, because this is the biggest part of the show. I really like this main event. I like Tessa in the blue a lot. I think it looks great on her. Maybe it's because those are LA Charger colors, but I think it looks really good. And I've always been one that I feel that baby faces should update their look as they progress um, with different feuds. You know what I mean? So that's just those little things that stop things from becoming, you know, bland. It, it's, it's much like with the YouTube channel. You know, I usually kind of change the the uh, thumbnails up every couple of months. You know, I've, I've had a couple different logos. I do that to just change the presentation of how the channel looks, you know. And, uh, you know, I've done, sometimes I do intros, sometimes I do background music, and then sometimes I don't do anything. You know, but it's it's just to change things up a little bit. So um, I really feel that, you know, it's, it's a good look when baby faces kind of update their look a little bit. You know, you want to get away from that. I've been feuding with Sammy Callahan for the last year type of look. You want to you want to look fresh. So I've said this before, too. Tessa has been a it's a huge breath of fresh air uh, watching her uh, without Sammy Callahan right now. Uh, the commentary, I talked about this on the last episode, Madison Rain stepped in. She did a good job. Uh, when she when she was doing Impact broadcasts a while back, whenever they had the knockouts wrestle, when the Pope was still there, I didn't think she sounded very good. It was, it was actually kind of painful for me to listen to. But she sounded really good this episode. Uh, I don't know if it bothered anyone else, but it's kind of... You know, Madison Rain, who's this clear-cut heel on television. She's about a heel for the first 30 seconds of the show and then kind of falls back into baby face. You know what I mean? I don't... That's kind of an impact thing. You know, they flip-flop and baby faces heels when it when it's necessary. Uh, you know, other companies don't really do that. So, you know, minor thing kind of bothered me a little bit just because I'm one of those people. I, I like to have a heel color commentator. That's why I'm always so harsh on Don Callis going back and forth is that I, I like that dynamic a lot. Um, the, I thought the commentary for the TNA show with, um, uh, David Penser and, um, who was with him, Scott Dumore. I thought they sounded great. I really did that. I don't know. They, they just had a wrestling TV show type of sound. You know, I don't know if that makes sense to anybody else, but it just sounded like you're watching a pro wrestling TV show. Like I really, Likes that, and even though I always hammer on Don Callis on the commentary, uh, I do every single time I podcast. The the issues I have with kind of how Josh has progressed, and it's really Don's fault. Clearly, Don was like, "Hey, this is how we're going to deliver the show." But and, and pay attention next time. 
he has got you, and it, this was really clear in the main event. He's kind of gone from calling play by play to just asking the color commentator a bunch of questions throughout the match, to where the color commentator does all the talking, and it's almost like Josh is is kind of minimal. You know, he just kind of steps in a little bit, but he he's always deferring to the color commentator, and I've never heard that. You know, it's like they're trying to have a conversation. I've never heard that style of broadcasting before. I watch a lot of sports, baseball, football, basketball, whatever. Obviously, other wrestling companies. I don't hear that kind of style of commentary from anyone else. So I kind of wish Josh would go back to, you know, kind of calling the action in the ring because I think he, he does a pretty good job when he's he's doing that. But um, So for me, the commentary on both episodes was was a huge step up, though, from what we normally get. I'll say, I'll say that much. But the main event, I was entertained with it. A lot of people have been saying, well, how is Tessa going to wrestle a bunch of dudes all the time? Now, it's one thing to say, okay, Tessa's going to wrestle these intergender matches, but every, you know, we're wrestling OVE every week. So, you know, you can kind of protect her. Once she beats Sammy, people are like, well, you know, remember when Booker T gave the big criticism, it's the worst decision Impact has ever made and everything. Yeah, it's kind of like, okay, she wins the championship. How does she defend it, though? You know, because certainly she can't just run through a bunch of the dudes. <laughs> I don't mean to say it like that. She can't just be beating a bunch of dudes on the roster. You know, because then it weakens them. But I feel like they've done a really good job with just those little tweaks in the matches to where Tessa wins. And it's not... We I know we love to use the, the word bury a lot. She's not burying people, but it's not... They're not looking weak in the process. Like OVE to me looked always looked really weak leaving matches with her. But you have, you know, losses to I mean, I mean um, people who've lost to her like Ethan Page and a couple of the other dudes she's wrestled. There's always that, that little tweak. Like when Eddie came at the end and there was the distraction and everything, it it works. You know what I mean? It was a clean victory, but at the same time it kind of wasn't clean. And I kind of see where they're going with it. So I think they're doing an ex- excellent job with Tessa, I would have much rather her be facing Eddie Edwards one-on-one at the pay-per-view or even, I wouldn't say Elgin quite yet. I ultimately want to see Moose take the title offer. That's my preference as a fan. Um, I'm not a big fan of multi-man title matches because what happens when she beats both? Say she beats, beats them both. Now you've just knocked out two guys with one stone who are main eventers. Where do you go from here, you know? So I, I kind of wish they would have just, you know, they put us through weeks of this best of five series only to have no definitive win, definitive winner at the end. I think was a real, I think it creatively was a disservice. The wrestling was good, but creatively it was kind of a disservice. So I wish you would have just be, be taking on one of them. Even though Ethan Page lost, Josh Alexander did not earlier, so I think it kept the North looking strong. I don't like champions losing non-title matches, even if they're the tag team champions. I've never been a fan of that. If you guys remember when Impact kicked off the Access TV era, every single champion lost within the first three episodes. Um, Sammy Callahan lost his first match. It was, it was the sixth man, but he got pinned by Rich Swan. Uh Josh Alexander lost to somebody. I think it was Marifuji. Um, and then I think I think the North actually lost a non-title tag match as well um, on one of those episodes. Ty Valkyrie lost, I think, twice in the first three episodes. And the only one who didn't lose was Ace Austin, but he he lost on the first... Uh, it was a first or second special event of the year. It was a table match versus Eddie Edwards. But my point was the champions were losing a lot. I didn't think that was a good way to kick off the year. The champions are starting to look a little bit stronger now. Um, and Ethan Page, even though he lost, I think that I was I was watching this episode. I said he would make an excellent world champion one day. Like he, I think he has a look. He has the mic skills. He has the the ring work. He's transformed his body from when he first came in. He's dedicated to the company. He understands social media. He has a successful YouTube channel. I really think he should be consulted for the impact youtube channel he does a lot of good things right you know he would make a a very out of the blue like really good world champion if he he had the title i think um 
And one thing that impact does that most companies don't, and this is one of those things that people overlook, is that the impact heels for the most part are not cowards. You know, aside from, you know, Ace Austin, sometimes Ty of Valkyrie, for the most part, they're not, they, they don't do the coward thing where they're running away. Like Ethan Page actually made this challenge. So that helped him uh, look strong as well. So even though he lost, he had a really good episode. Um, Josh Alexander, as I said, he did not lose. He beat Eddie Edwards. Now, people say, if Eddie is in the world title picture, why is he losing? You know? I would have rather Josh Alexander won this match because he, again, is a champion. The North have been the title holders for how long now? That meaning nobody has been able to beat these guys. So I don't like the thinking of, oh, well, he's a he's in a singles match, so it's okay if he loses. I, I don't think so. I, I don't like that. I think, I think he should look strong. So in my opinion, the right guy won. Now, I would say a majority of the people probably would have, you know, felt that Eddie should have won. Um, I didn't think, you know, it wasn't a clean victory, but it wasn't, you know, super dirty either. Like, I I, I liked how it came off, um, and it was a really good, enjoyable match. Kylie Ray debuts. She takes on Cassandra Golden. The editing of this show was a little rough tonight. Or not tonight, I'm sorry. A couple nights ago. The, the editing was a little rough. It, like I don't know what happened to where they just hit um all of a sudden her her music started playing the Titan it just came out of nowhere you know what I mean it was, it was kind of weird but I know that you know I reported this before that a lot of extra editing was done at these shows because it was since they had to cancel events and it was given away you know spoilers and things like that so it's a lot of editing that they they had to do Kylie Ray looked really good here now the co- the the comparison is always going to be there to Ali to Bailey like you know what I mean but I think Kylie is ha- is her own person and the difference with her is that even though she comes out with the I think her music and entrance is great by the way even though she comes out with the smiley you know smiley faces and the smiles and the high and she puts her game face on in the match too. You know what I mean? Like she goes from zero to a hundred, and I think that's where, that's what sets her aside. You know, from like the Alley character. Plus, Kylie's probably better in the ring than her too. But this was a good match. It, it was less than three minutes long, but it it felt longer in my opinion, and I didn't think it. You know, it was a good debut where it wasn't a total squash. Uh, but it it was a good debut, and. Uh, they did an interview after, and I thought that was really well done when she, you know, announced that she was long term with Impact. Kylie Ray was such an excellent signing. Um, I don't think they've had a, a signing this good, and I'll tell you what I mean exactly since. Hmm. I was almost almost gonna say since uh, Rich Swan. I'll say probably since maybe Pentagon and Phoenix came aboard. The reason I say this is because over the past year, two years, they've signed some really talented up-and-comers, and then they've signed some big names. But they haven't signed anybody with buzz and momentum. You can look at Johnny Impact. You can look at, you know, Austin Aries. You can look at... um you know, Michael Elgin overall to me has been their best signing in a while. But you can kind of look at that situation. You can look at uh, Brian. You know, Brian Cage had a li- little bit of buzz behind him with Lucha Underground. But you can look at all these guys they brought on Rhino, um, Tennille Dashwood, talented people, people with names, and Chris Bay as far as a talent. But nobody with real momentum and real buzz and. Kylie Ray's stock has never been higher than it is right now because of that brief run with AEW to where everyone's like, well, where's she going to go now? And this is the first real free agency sweepstakes that Impact has won in a while. 
I was telling someone the other day over um, DM, I don't remember exactly who I was talking to, that I really think Impact will, will take the next big turn when they sign that next Kurt Angle. You know, you remember how, how big that was. Uh, ha- had they been able to bring like John Moxley aboard, that would have been a turning point for the company. So you can sign talented people, you can sign people with names, but you have to sign people with buzz and momentum. And then you also have to sign someone to where they chose impact over the other companies. You know, that's where, uh, that's where things are going to get, start taking off in my opinion. So that's why this was a really excellent uh, signing for them. Uh, Moose takes on Kid Cash. And this goes back to what I said earlier, squash match. Kid Cash was, you know, lasted a minute in there. Yeah, he got all the offense in, but he he was squashed. But he looks good for his age. Um, but it's tough to get excited for the TNA show and then the No Place Like Home if, if these guys are, are losing so quickly, you know? I've talked about this a lot uh, over the past year, year and a half. Um, Moose clearly is on a mission to battle TNA's past. This goes all the way back to him facing RVD at Slammiversary, I think it was. There may have even been someone before that. But if you think of, you know, RVD, Rhino, Shamrock, the TNA guys to where at Lockdown, one of the big matches is Moose versus Suicide. If you look at that, he's clearly been doing this for a while. Wanting to take on legends, Hall of Famers, uh, you know, people from the, the past. It's clear that that's what they're doing with him, but I just don't, I just feel like they don't present that on TV strong enough. Because if you do a better job of, you know, of putting that across, you can ultimately build to something really big, like a rebellion, someone coming back from, you know, he challenged Mon- Monty Brown on Twitter, you know, uh, you know, who knows what will come of that, but. You can actually build all this over time to where Moose has to face a legitimate freaking uh, big name from the past. Who that could be, I don't know. But I just feel like they should they should do a bit better job with what they're trying to do with Moose. I think Moose is my favorite person in the company right now. You know, they're even teasing that he doesn't win any championships. So it's like... Uh, yeah. They really need to bring up mid card title. I don't care. NWA has two mid card titles. They have a TV championship that has purpose. Now, uh, you know, Ring of Honor's had a TV championship. Now AEW is going to have one. And it's crazy because a lot of fans on Twitter and Facebook were like, "We need a mid card title." But a lot of people had said they should. It should be like an Access TV championship. I think Lewis even said it on his podcast. It should be an Access TV title. A lot of people have have said that and now there's the TNT title. So now you couldn't even do that if you wanted to. So that does, you know, the, (coughs) excuse me guys, that's one of the examples where impacts got to stay ahead of the curve because once you start letting other people do stuff now, you know, now even if they do introduce a mid card title, we're just go, Oh, well NWA and AEW just announced new ones. So now, you know, here they are. Um, But they need a mid card title. Moose, one of those guys that he's fighting for nothing right now, but at least he is has a storyline of why he isn't. Like, he's trying to prove himself, but we'll see where it goes. Um, the backstage interview with Jimmy Jenkins, Jacobs, uh, he had AC Romero and Larry D, Triple XL. I thought that was pretty good. The, the yelling was all very 80s. You know, um, TJP and Falaba came. Uh, this is a criticism I'm, I'm, I'm going to make, and I, I haven't really focused on this too much before but it didn't really stand out it's been standing out to me for a while but more so this episode i really think impact needs to work on um better acting on these backstage segments this one is not that bad of an example uh because i actually thought larry d and ac romero sounded good and then the tjp and follow back came out started getting a little hokey but you know the Sue Young segment where the guy took off running, you know, ah, and, 
even you know rich swans um you know uh, via satellite and everything which we need to get away from that term because now you can skype everything it's not via wi-fi you know what i mean but you know that some of the backstage segments with you know the stuff with rosemary the people the extras they use or a lot of the time they don't even use extras but they use people who are part of the company and they're you know, you'll see them in a backstage segment, and then three weeks later, you'll see them one in one again, and they're playing a different person. You know, it, it's like they're so they're stretched so thin. You know, but I really think some of the acting has been really bad lately, and that that's kind of with those little subtle differences with a, a product coming off as professional or and and hokey. You know, because then you play these backstage segments on social media, and they come off bad you know so I, I really think this is something that's kind of new you know in in the past i've always felt the backstage segments were all done very well but now i'm starting to think some of the wrestlers are getting away from working on their promo skills and i don't think bringing you know local actors and actresses in to do some back backstage segments w- wouldn't be a bad idea um or would be a bad idea i don't know if i'm using the context correctly but you know the stuff like you know, again, the guy running from Sue Young and screaming, you know, is that how someone's really going to act? No, you know, so uh, that's just what I've been noticing lately. Obviously, there's, there's been the you know criticisms of Alicia for a while, but I think some of the promo work needs to tighten up um, and, the, and the acting. But most mostly in the backstage things, which usually should be easier to act and do multiple cuts than, you know, doing something in the ring. But the Rich Swan thing... I thought um, it was a little hard for me to to watch. It was it was just it was weird. It was very weird. Ace Austin is not a bad actor. He's a great actor, but when he came in, and you know, does this make any sense? Like, let's just say you're at home. You're talking to your mortal enemy over Skype over the phone. You're at home with a broken leg. And he's like, hey, answer the door. There's a couple of guys there who are going to kick your ass. Would you get up and answer the door? But even the way Rich Swan's like, ah, there's nobody there. I mean, it, it took it. It just didn't come off serious, you know? You know? So uh, I wasn't a real big fan of what they did there. Sammy Callahan comes out. He's got new music. He's obviously going in a different direction. And I like it. What I don't like is him still yelling everything, thumbs up, thumbs down. Like, he's still OVE Sammy Callahan. And I really would like to see more changes. You know, he's changed the way he looks. He changed the music. So those are very important when you're when you're kind of using a new gimmick. Those are really important to connect with the audience and the fans in a, in a different way to where you don't think it's the same person coming out there. But when the terminology is the same, you're, you're, you're moving exactly the same, the move set is kind of the same. Like, I used to say this about Broken Matt Hardy, he did all these new, wonderful things, but then when he wrestled, the move set was exactly the same. And then I used an example of, you know, Stardust, uh, Cody Rhodes, to where when he became Stardust, he introduced a bunch of new moves. So sometimes when you have a gimmick change like Sammy Callahan, I would have liked to see some new things you know, some new moves, a new move says some, just something, you know. Um, but he cut a he cut a great promo. What he did in the ring, I thought was was really excellent. Again, I would just get away from the everything, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, because now you can't differentiate him from OBE. And Tommy Dreamer comes out. This goes without saying. You guys know I can't stand Tommy Dreamer segments and matches. And I've been saying it for about two years. Um, but he comes out and, you know, thank God Tommy Dreamer never wins. You know, I say that him and Rhino are taking on OVE next week. I, you know, I'll put money on it that OVE is going to lose. But Dreamer comes out and I lost interest pretty quickly seeing him out there. But I'll give Tommy this. He did cut a good, he's a good promo. He can talk. Is it the same thing, you know, the Terry Funk, the Dusty Road? Yeah, it's 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 always the same thing. 
you know, talking about the people who came before the, you know, before him and before, you know, I'm kind of over that, but, but he can talk and, uh, you know, Sammy challenges him or they have a match. I don't even know. I don't even remember exactly what happened, but they had a match. It's old school rules. You know, old school rules to me is getting really old. We just had, we had it on this episode and the TNA show, you know, every time that Rhino and Tommy Dreamer wrestle, it doesn't need to be old school rules. But they did that, and the match was too long. I mean, it was, uh, you know, 13 minutes long. I would I would have given it about three or four less minutes, and I know that sounds like nothing, but that's really an eternity when you're watching a match sometimes. It was a little long, you know, considering Eddie Edwards versus Josh Alexander was like nine minutes. You know, I thought they gave it a little, little too much time. And then Rhino comes down, so is he going to face Rhino next? I mean, uh, I, I don't know if I really care for that. You know him. You know, I mean, his promo did justify wanting to wrestle. You know, some of these guys like Rhino, Dreamer, Shamrock. It did justify that. So I, I'll, I'll give it that much. What was intriguing was OVE comes out at the end, and at first I'm kind of like, okay, so are they together or not? And then the lights go out, and he clearly leaves them. So now we're getting interesting again. I always get upset when OBE loses. You know that. You know, lately they've been saying, okay, well, it's part of a... Now they're saying, oh, there's a losing streak. Like, now they're kind of acknowledging it. So this is interesting because we got to get OBE back on the winning track creatively. Because Sammy's obviously going off on his own. So it leads me to believe... OVE has to bring, a, you know, there has to be a new wrinkle within OVE, the faction. People have been asking for a female in the group for a long time. I think it would be an excellent opportunity to bring Jake's wife in for her to actually be the leader of the stable. Now, she can wrestle, too, so she, she you know, it's, it, they do need new knockouts. I think she would be an excellent addition. We've always thought that. But for her to come in and not be a sideshow, but to actually be in charge of OVE... I think would be excellent and it would it would drum up a lot more interest back into them because now we look at them as a, a team that's probably going to go out there and lose. You know, it's hard to get excited about them. These guys, Dake and, <laughs> Dake, Jake and Dave used to be tag team champions. So how can we breathe some new life into OVE? I think separating from Sammy is going to help, but you have to, you know, you have to, who's going to say everything? Who's going to do thumbs up, thumbs down? It can't be all of them, you know? And maybe Sammy was only doing that this episode because they were, you know, baiting us in to where he's still part of OBE. That would make sense, but I'm I'm going to say no. <laughs> I'm going to say that Sammy's going to keep doing that stuff. Now, the thumbs up, thumbs down is his gimmick. But again, the gimmick is changing a little. So would lo- just love to see a little bit of progression. Um, I talked about the Susie thing backstage. Even though her contract was up, she was at this episode, this set of tapings. And it looks like they're still going to kind of go with the Susie thing a little bit. So this is going to be interesting. I like the Susie stuff a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. You know, a couple of the segments have a little, been a little bit hokey. Even though I criticized the the uh, acting earlier, the Deaners are great actors. I thought they did a really good in their role in this. And... As a matter of fact, the Diener promo a couple weeks ago about, uh, you know, teasing the Joey Ryan match where it kept showing them, you know, a close up on their face one by one. And it, it was a comedy segment. I thought they killed that. I thought that was excellent. I think the Diener should do more of that. I think that's the way you get them across on television. Those backstage seg- segments were, for them would be awesome when they have feuds and everything because they are genuinely funny i've said this too before i hate when wrestlers who are not funny or people who are not funny try to be funny and they're funny i can tell that these are funny guys so i'm, I'm pretty high on the deaners right now i'm real high on them um speaking of the deaners cody deaner takes on joseph ryan and um it was odd that it was a good win for the deaners it was odd that Joey Ryan would lose um, because cancel culture needs some momentum. And right now, cancel culture has been Joey Ryan. 
you know, he came out during the Scott Ste- Steiner segment when she said when he said big proper pump. I thought that was absolutely hilarious. But he loses the match, and it's like I don't, I don't get why he's losing number one because you're trying to cancel people, okay? And you pretty much get can't like he can't. Well, they can have a rematch now. You know what I mean? You're, you're supposed to be canceling the people now. Does this mean okay? Well, him and RVD when they're gonna have a tag team match, they'll beat the Deaners. We'll see. But right now, as I said, cancel culture is Joey Ryan. We're not getting RVD and um, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, Katie Forbes. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry about that. She follows me on Instagram. God forbid, I'm so sorry. Um, we we don't see RVD and Katie Forbes. Forbes. And. I really think we need to see them all out there as a whole. Maybe they're like, okay, we don't want Joe, Joey Ryan to be losing matches and then have RVD out there with him because you're kind of supposed to relate him to being a winner. So I don't know. Um, I've said in the past I really think cancel culture is pretty cool, but there's a lot of tweaks they can do within the presentation to make it a bigger deal. Joey Ryan's doing an excellent job. I'd like to see RVD and Katie Forbes um, change their appearance a little bit as well and kind of adjust to what Joey Ryan's doing. You know, where he's got the Joseph Ryan. I've said this before, you know, Robert Van Dam, Caitlin Forbes, you know what I'm saying? Like, let's go all in on this, the cancel culture thing. But it, it, it was odd to just, you know, he, Ryan's still kind of coming off. They have the gimmick change and he's still kind of coming off of the, a jobber, which, you know, we'll see. We'll see where you know where they go with it. The Eddie and Tessa, they have the backstage thing, thing where Eddie offers her help up, offers offers his help. I'm sorry. And when I'm going back to what I said about that, the the promos, the acting, you know, I spent four and a half years as a as an instructor in the in the military, and we would watch a lot of tape of ourselves. We would listen to a lot of audio. We would even teach our fellow instructors when we had downtime and get criticisms. The reason we did that is because we're looking for those little things to make the presentation better. And one thing that in the in- teaching world, the instructing world, you know, especially in the military, maybe it's maybe not like in a civilian sector with teachers and everything, but I know as instructors in the military, you want to pay attention to the little distractors that you have. When I was a uh, when I was an instructor, I used to have a thing. Every time it got quiet, <clears throat> I coughed. Every time, and and people were like, you know, that's your filler, right? Your little, you know, it, it's the same concept of when things get when you're maybe doing a presentation for your class in high school or college, and you get quiet and you start going um, because in our heads we don't like to hear silence. So my cough was always my little filler, my little transitional. Filler. But the point of what I'm saying is we would pay attention to those little distractors that would annoy our students. So I had a class I went through a couple of years ago where my instructor would keep going. And we got to the point we started writing, you know, hash, hash marks in the back. How many times does he do it in an hour? Because it was distracting from the, the lesson he was trying to give us. Just a very weird tick that he had. And uh, long story short, what I'm getting at, I think that if Tesla were to watch herself back, you know, there, there's... She has a lot of go-to facial expressions, um, things she does with her hands that I, I think are a little too much sometimes. You know, this... I, I guess she kind of does on purpose, but, you know, the tongue-in-cheek, you know the this the, the the you know dramatic facial expressions. I think if she maybe she does watch herself back and maybe she wants to do that stuff. God knows. But for me, some of these things become a bit, bit of a distractor, and uh, I think she should. I, I think they should look at lessening some of those little minor things that she does. But uh, yeah, she's doing this thing where and this is always how this works, right? The baby face goes to the other baby face and says, "Hey, I got your back out there." And they're like, I want to do this on my own. Which kind of makes no sense because Tessa saved his butt earlier 
And then when he stopped trying to return the favor, she's almost like, I got this. So kind of odd. Next week, we're getting uh, Chris Bay versus Daga. So I think they had a match for the X Division ladder match at Bound for Glory. I think they were one of the qualifiers. So this would kind of be a rematch. Chris Bay, excellent addition. If you guys saw the last episode of Impact, all of a sudden he's a heel. So he's like a baby face as a debut, and then he just randomly becomes a heel. And Josh is selling all this shit on commentary about, oh, he's, you know, real proud of himself and, you know, real pompous and real, like, what? Where did all this shit come from? You know, that, w- that was really odd, but it looks like they're going to make him a heel in the X Division. But, you know, since the beginning of time, they've never built up anything when it comes to the X Division gimmicks. Uh, Rhino and Dreamer taking on OVE. I mean, we know what's going to happen there, right? It's probably going to be old school rules. Uh, the old guys are probably going to win. And then Ken Shamrock addresses Sammy Callahan. Uh, that's what it is. So um, that's all I got for the episode. I was I was entertained for the most part. I was entertained with the TNA stuff. Uh, it was okay, you know, not amazing, but it was okay. But the Tessa versus Ethan Page match was was great. Eddie versus uh, Josh Alexander was great. And that's that's been the impact formula for a while is to have, you know, the strong bookends. And uh, the Sammy Callahan promo was really good. Didn't, you know, didn't care for Dreamer, obviously, but his his promo was good. And, you know, uh, Kylie Ray's debut was excellent. That just, she just, she just looked really good out there. And she just, again, excellent addition. Someone with some genuine buzz for once but uh impact does have to continue this where they're signing guys with momentum with buzz people who are choosing them over other companies once they get some of that under their belt it's going to cause some momentum positive momentum for the company so thanks for checking me out guys i just wanted to you know kind of do a quick review like this in this format but uh you know myself and tw when i get back from mississippi we'll we'll be taking over and, uh, you know, maybe we'll do some live streams. I just don't have my microphone. I don't like to use the mic for my webcam. But, you know, that might might be what happens. We will see. Thanks for rocking with me. I am your boy, BQ. This is the Impact Lounge. And I'm out. Peace. <laughs>